welcome Pastor Jeremy as he comes to break the word today. All right, thank you. Yes. Uh, go ahead and uh, put this up on the screen. I want you guys to take a look at this before I get started today. I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to hope she's got it down the way I do. Now, marriage is hard. Divorce is hard. Choose your hard. Being out of shape is hard. Being fit is hard. Choose your hard. All right, communication. Communication is hard. Not communicating is hard. Choose your hard. And the last one, being in debt is hard. Being financially disciplined is hard. So, today, um, I'm approaching this calling it the curse breaker. I'm big on that because if you notice, most of us as the children of God have an internal kingdom dream that God placed inside of us. I didn't say fantasy, I said a kingdom dream, an assignment, something He placed in you as a goal for your life that you are to do what you need to do to obtain that dream that He gave you. Not your dream that you're trying to get Him to get on page with. I'm talking about the dream He gave you. If you're still holding on to it, then you should be seeking the kingdom first in order to obtain it. Okay? Now, for whatever reason... We don't automatically just get to obtain the dream that God gave us. There is a process that we have to walk through. And along that process, we will begin to find out that we have all kinds of obstacles in our life. Such as curses. I know that's a big word and it sounds big. But if you think about it, is your family right now, I want you to evaluate your family and your life does it look like the fulfillment of the dream that God gave you at this point? Or does it have more work to do? Okay, then there's things in your life that need to be moved out of the way. There are things that have to get undone, broken, removed, out of here. So that you can move on. You remember the last time I spoke? You would be surprised. How many people are waiting on you to have your breakthrough? They're waiting on you because until you have it, they can't move. If you ever understand that, you will begin to realize things on a whole lot bigger picture with your life. Everything feels stuck, that's because everybody's waiting. So today, I'm going to cover a tough subject. I didn't want to do this. It might be a little boring, but it doesn't matter. I've got to get it out so I can get it off my plate and move on. Okay, so can you all bear that with me today? In the Bible, there is a test that we have to take. I remember the first day of my fourth grade year, Dad pulled us out of one school and put us in another school about two or three weeks into the school. You talk about a jarring, traumatic effect. And I walked into the classroom. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And Mrs. O'Flaherty was our fourth grade teacher. And she said, class, I want you to put away your literature books. It's test time. Okay. Well, the Bible gives us a test every time you get paid. Yep, you see where this is going, don't you? And the test is, whom are you going to thank for your income? Oh, Jeremy, come on, that's easy, that's easy. I know who to thank, it's God. We thank God for our income. Okay, okay. Well, you verbally know the right answer, but wait, I haven't told you how to take the test yet. Okay? There's a how to take this test because you take the test by what you do with the first 10% of your income. This is your test. Whom or what are you going to think, and whom or what are you going to worship for your income? Some people, they like to think AT&T, or MasterCard, 
or going out to a nice dinner is the first one that they like to pay. But the only problem is, is the Texas Roadhouse does not have the power to bless your finances. But God does. Now, I'm going to start out reading the Scripture. Now, I'm not going to ask you to take my word for anything today because this is a tough subject. So all I'm going to do is just give you straight word. That way, if you're upset with me, you can take it up with him. Malachi chapter 3, I'm going to start with verse 6. For I am the Lord, and I don't change. Okay, stop. We got to get this set first. He's the Lord. He don't change. Okay, get it locked in. He ain't going to change. If you're waiting on him to change, (laughs) it ain't going to happen. Guess who's going to change by the time it's over? He doesn't change. All right, let's continue on. Therefore, since I don't change, you're not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Stop. Now, what I think he's saying here is I don't change, and that's why I ain't killed you yet. That's what I think he's saying. I'm patient. And I'm still patient. That's why you're still alive. That's what I think he's trying to say. Okay? Verse 7. Let's move on. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you're saying, in what way shall we return? Stop. Now let's take a look at what he just said. He said, look, you've gone away from my ordinances. Well, what's an ordinance? Well, I didn't know either, so I look it up. What is it? It's an authoritative order. A decree. It's an order from the boss is what it is. The big man said, do it. That's what an ordinance is. You have gone away from my ordinance or decree for God's children. And what did they say? How? In what way? What way did we do it? And God said in verse 8, Will a man rob God or steal from God? Yet you have robbed me. You have stolen from me. And you're saying, in what way have we robbed you, Lord? How? In tithes and offerings. So you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all of the tithes into the storehouse. That'd be the church. Why? That there may be food in my house. Try me in this. Go ahead. Try me, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out to you such great blessing that there's not even going to be room enough to receive it. And, which means there's more than that, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all of the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, this is God talking. And this is the God who cannot change. And he says, you have gone away from my ordinances. You're not doing what I told you to do. And tithing is an ordinance for God's children to thank God for their income. But he says, because you have gone away from my ordinance, now you are under a curse. Now listen, you need to understand this. We all need to understand this. I know that sometimes people get to thinking like this. Well... Christians can't be under a curse because Christ bore the curse of the law on the cross. Well, yes, He did. But that's in regards to our salvation. So if you go around saying that you can live any way that you want and it doesn't affect you, that's crazy. That's crazy thinking. That's crazy. Why would you think that? I mean, if we lie... If we cheat, if we murder, if we steal, there will be consequences. 
So what is a curse? A consequence. Are you with me so far? I'm just going straight by word. I'm going straight by word. I've heard people say, yeah, but the Lord already owns everything. He already owns it all. Okay, yes, He does. But actually, He gives us stewardship over it. But He reserves 10% for Himself. Okay, stay with me. That's why He says that you have stolen from Me. Why? Because I have set apart the tithe for the house of God. So, if you keep that, then you're stealing it. You're stealing it. It's not yours. You're stealing it. It's not that you're refusing to do it. You're stealing it. These words are stern and they're direct. And God says that you have stolen from me. You've robbed me, and because of that, you're under a curse. And I don't want you living under a curse, but you are allowing yourself to be under a curse because of you going away from my ordinance. Now, let me just ask you a quick question. If we find ourselves debating about tithing, or dismissing tithing because it's in the Old Testament, then perhaps we should evaluate our hearts and ask ourselves this question. By what spirit am I arguing this? By what spirit are you arguing this? Ask yourself this. Don't tell me what your argument is. Ask yourself, in what spirit are you arguing this topic? I mean, why would I argue this when God gave His Son for you? And you won't even give Him 10%. Why would you argue about this? I am telling you that because this is a test of the heart. And it doesn't matter if you make 30 bucks or 30 million. doesn't matter. It's one dime Per dollar for everybody. We all in the same boat. Whether you make a lot of money or a little money. If you make ten bucks, you owe a dollar. If you get blessed and move on up to where you're making ten thousand dollars, you owe a thousand. One dime per dollar. All right. Now here's something I want to point out to you. Let's go on to verse 10. I'm still in the same story. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the church. That there may be food in my house. Now try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. And see if I'll not just open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there's not even going to be room enough to receive it. Try me now. Hmm. These words try. Test. Prove comes from the way that you test gold to see if it's pure. You know what God's saying? Test me. Test me. See if I'm pure. Go ahead. Go for it. Now look, I want you to remember this. I know I'm talking about money, but I want you to remember this. A God blessing that's being poured out on you is not always necessarily going to be about money. There's a whole lot of other garbage we're dealing with in our lives. There's a whole lot of curses that people carry that need to be lifted. It ain't just money. Okay? There's other things. There's other things that can happen when the Lord pours a blessing out. In fact, I will stand here and tell you, I've had money, and there's times I ain't had money. There's times God has blessed me with finances. But there was no bigger blessing that I have ever experienced in my life than the Lord pulling back the veil for my wife and I to see each other in Christ and to also have the same experience with my children. That's worth more to me than any money I could have ever received. This is not just about money, guys. This is not just about money. But we've got to get this established. We've got to get this established. Why? 
Because God says that I want you to test me. And I want you to see because I want to be the ones that opens up the heaven for you. And I want to bless you. And I want to rebuke the devourer for you. But it depends on whether you are going to thank me and worship me and walk in faith and whether you are going to believe that 90% with God's blessing is going to go further than 100% without it. Yeah, yeah, Jeremy, but that's in the Old Testament. Yeah, it is. And it's under the law, and we are under grace. So that does not apply to me. Listen, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that we do this to be saved. Because obviously we're saved by grace. But, I love that but, there are principles that we're under the law that we should still walk in as believers. Okay? Thou shalt not commit adultery. That was under the law. So are you saying that as a believer we can just walk in adultery and that there's not going to be any consequences? Really? Thou shalt not murder. Oh, that was under the law. Are you saying it because it was? That it's under the law that it's okay to do it now? So yes, tithing is in the Bible, okay? And I know there's a lot of people that don't tithe, and that has nothing to do with you being a bad person. I've had seasons that I wasn't tithing. I get it. It was never a real strong area that I was just like, woo, about. It was like pulling teeth for me quite a bit. It doesn't mean you're a bad person if you don't do it. And it doesn't mean that you're a rebellious person. But a lot of people don't really believe that it's in the Bible. And they don't believe that it's for us today. But let me show you some scriptures real quick. I want you to buckle down. Stay with me. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 14. I'm going to start at verse 18. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or Solom, which Salem means peace, He's the king of peace. It's interesting. He brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God, the Most High, and, and he blessed him. Him who? He's talking about Abraham. And he said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, being Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. Okay, Jeremy, well, here you go again. This is still under the law. Well, no, it's not. No, it's not. This is not under the law. Well, yes, it is, Jeremy. It's in the Old Testament. It's not under the law. Abraham was about 500 years before Moses. And Moses was the one that delivered the law. And Galatians tells us that Abraham is our spiritual father and Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Are you seeing the pieces? And if my memory serves me right, Dad, I think I remember that when you taught on the subject of Melchizedek a long time ago that he could have possibly been Jesus Christ. Maybe. Doesn't say it for sure, but it sounded like it could be. King of priests. Yeah, in Hebrews 7 verse 3 it says he didn't have a mom or a dad. No beginning of days and no end of life. This was Melchizedek, whoever this guy is. He, was, he may have been Jesus back then. So this guy is either Jesus himself or he's a type of Christ in some way and our spiritual father tithes. He gives 10%, 500 years before the law because it's a principle. I say, okay, Jeremy, okay, I get what you're saying. I get it. It's a principle. And it's a test. I get it. I get it. But all those scriptures are still in the Old Testament. Yes. Okay. They are. Now what if Jesus himself said it? Then would you tithe? Hmm? It's not the Old Testament. 
If you still ain't settled on the fact that it wasn't under the law, it was even before the law came that it was happening. And then Jesus in the New Testament says it. The one that died on the cross, the one that drank the cup of sin, said that you ought to give 10%. Then would you tithe? You want to know what the Scripture is? Matthew 23, 23. Here we go. Are you ready for this? Jesus says, Woe to you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin. These are spices. And you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving this other undone. Did you catch it? What did he just say? All right, let me try it again. Let me try it again. Let me try to unscramble it. He said, you guys give tithes. And in fact, you're not only giving tithes on your first fruits, you're also giving tithes on all your spices you use on your food. But you've neglected justice, mercy, and faith. And then Jesus said, you ought to do that. What? The, the justice and mercy and faith. That's important. It's a weighty matter. But don't leave the other undone. The other what? Tithing. Don't leave it undone. Jesus said that. Don't leave it undone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Jeremy, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. But answer me this. Here's another question. How do we know that if we tithe that it actually goes to God? Well, that's a good question. I asked that same question myself. Like, how does that work? Because if you don't get this settled, then you feel like it's a scam. It's okay. It's okay. Let's just get it settled. Let's go to Hebrews. I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to let the Word tell you. I ain't even going to get out in front of this. Hebrews 7, we're going to do verse 8. Here, here, mortal men receive tithes, but there... He receives them, of whom it is witnessed that He lives. When you give your tithes and offering, mortal men take care of it. Yes, they do. They manage it. But in heaven, He receives it, of whom it is witnessed that He lives. He receives it. Yes, you put it in here, people take care of it, but He receives it there. Okay, that's Hebrews 7, 8. That makes me want to tithe. Even if I don't always like it, it makes me want to do it. All right, let me give you another story. You guys with me? I'm just trying to get this out of the way. I'm just trying to get this out of the way because we need to get this fixed. Some people need to come to grips with this. All right, Hezekiah in Chronicles 31 He's reading the scriptures and he sees this verse about tithing and they're in some kind of an economic problem. They're in a recession or a depression or something's going on and he realizes that we're under a curse. The whole nation. Because we're not tithing and we're stealing from God. So that's where we're going to pick up this story. Now I'm going to jump to 2 Chronicles 31, starting at verse 4. Hang with me. I know it's a lot of Scripture. Just hang with me. Moreover, He commanded the people who dwelt in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priest and the Levites that they might devote themselves to the law of the Lord. Stop. Remember what Malachi said? Now, I know they're talking about natural food, but I think about today, I think about spiritual food. Let me ask you something. When you come to church, do you enjoy the spiritual food that you get? Someone is paying for it. I, I, I know it sounds kind of blunt. I don't mean to sound blunt. and I don't mean to be offensive in some way by saying that. Oh, I'm just trying to give you a little reality check. Someone is paying for this building. Somebody's paying the utilities, salaries, Children's ministry, building projects, and on and on and on. There are expenses. Someone is paying for all of that. I mean, would you go out to the Red Onion 
and order you a big, nice, awesome bowl of onion soup. The cheese melted over the top like it's got this crust. And a sandwich. And then leave without paying for it. Would you do that? Some Christians do that every week. They go to church, eat the meal, skip out on the check. Come on, preacher. <laughs> And, and here's the sad thing about it. You're the one that it's hurting. Okay. Everybody needs to bring the tithe into the house of God. Now let's go to verse 5. As soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and all of the produce of the field, and they brought it in abundantly, the tithe of everything. Verse 6. And the children of Israel and Judah who dwelt in the cities of Judah brought the tithe of oxen and sheep, also the tithe of holy things which were consecrated to the Lord their God that they laid in heaps. Heaps is a big pile. I mean, they just bring it out and put it in a pile. In the third month, they begin laying them in piles. And then they finished in the seventh month. So this has been going on for four months. And when Hezekiah and the leaders came and saw these big heaps, these big piles, they blessed the Lord and His people Israel. Then Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites concerning these big piles. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Well, since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have had plenty left. For the Lord has blessed His people, and what is left is in great abundance. Okay, here we go. Let me explain it to you. He's questioning them about these big piles, these big heaps of piles that they've brought out. And what he's saying is that, are the people okay? Look at how much they're giving. It's enormous. Are they even going to have enough left? And the priest said, well, king, as soon as the people started to do it God's way, God so blessed them. See, what you're seeing here is just the 10%. You ought to go take a look at the big 90%. Yeah. Go look at how God blessed His people when they began obeying His Word. Okay, listen, if you don't tithe because you can't afford to tithe, you will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Want me to say it again? If you don't tithe because you can't afford to tithe, you will never be able to afford to tithe until you tithe. Because tithing is what breaks the curse. And, and, go ahead, go ahead. But there's more to this. This is great because there's more to it than that. There's an and. Rebukes the devourer. So not only it does two things here. Breaks a curse and rebukes the devourer. I don't like the devourer. Because you know what the devourer does? He's, a, he's that joker that as soon as you start to get ahead, something else is going to break down. That's the devourer. Tithing is what rebukes.